So what I'm going to do is uh, do a bio introduction before each Hello, hello, hello. Um, first of all, this is being live streamed, so keep your applause loud and um, any other comments, not so loud. Um, I have been asked by um, uh, Mary Taylor, who's the as assistant director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, uh, to have you sign up to receive notifications about our events at the uh, CPCP. And so all we need is a name and email address, and we don't spam. We don't spam. I'm Peter Hitchcock, uh, the associate director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. And I'm not going to say very much because we have such a, uh, a wonderful uh, event on tap and three really good uh, speakers. I would like to say, though, um, in, ad in addition to thanking Mary Taylor for doing the, uh, uh, the, the grunt work, as it were, uh, in putting this together, that this, this academic year, the Centre has been uh, devoting its analysis to the theme of after debt. And uh, we've run the center's seminar around that theme. And several of those people are, who are uh, part participants in that uh, seminar are with us uh, today. Uh, so th they'll be ready to take part in the conversation right from the, uh, right the give-go. Um, we didn't cleave to any particular uh, position. You know, it wasn't, we love Lazzarato or, or that kind of thing. Um, and we, uh, I think we pretty much shortened our analysis of debt. I mean, shorter than Graeber's 5,000 5, years. Um, nevertheless, uh, a few ideas came out, have come out of that uh, 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 seminar, and some of them are germane to the uh, discussions uh, that I hope we generate uh, today. I want to make two other announcements before we get cracking. First off is that immediately after this event, um, the CPCP, the Center for Place, Culture and Politics, is having its end of, uh, end of semester party um, up in the sociology lounge, uh, 6112, and you're all cordially invited uh, to that. Uh, I guess from about 7.30, 7.30 on, until they kick us out, 7.31. <laughs> And I also want to shamelessly advertise another uh, CPCP event uh, actually tomorrow at 5.30 in room 5414. And this is also on the subject of uh, debt, but it's a, a lecture by uh, uh, Joey Slaughter, um, Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature up at, the, uh, up at Columbia University. Uh, that uh, I think I've, you've heard of that school. It's somewhere north of north of here, um, and he's talking about uh, um, one of his favourite topics, human rights, but uh, especially in relation to um, early modern corporate uh, uh, colonialism and and the sort of the persistence of colonial charters and their facsimiles into uh, the present. Um, so, it, once again, from 5.30 to 7.30 in room 5414. Okay, now, to today. I'm, I'm going to introduce the speakers uh, in the order in which they appear in the ad for this particular uh, event. And I'm going to do one, uh, one at a time. So I'll do the intro before each uh, speaker. And actually, our first speaker, Jane Pollard, needs no introduction to other members of the seminar because she has been a visiting scholar uh, at the Graduate Centre um, this, um, uh, this year. Uh, she, is, she is Professor of Economic Geography in the Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies and the School of Geography, Politics and Sociology at Newcastle University. That's a lot of affiliation you have there. She has... <laughs> I won't, yeah. I won't go through all the degrees, but her research interests and writing have focused on geographies of money and finance, and that's actually where I first came across uh, Jane's work on finance and financialization. Um, geographical political economy and the practices and politics of economic geography as a sub-discipline. 
Her current research, while a visiting scholar at the Centre for Place, Culture and Politics, uh, focuses on the extension of subprime loan markets and the financialization of social reproduction. So give a warm welcome to Jane Pollock. Well, thank you very much for that um, very kind introduction. Um, what I want to do today is talk about some work um, I've been working on with uh, Evelyn Blumenberg and Stephen Brumball, who are both um, in the Urban Planning Program at UCLA. And this is work that um, I've been developing uh, out here, and is also this semester as part of um, the seminar group that Peter has just alluded to. So I also want to start by saying um, a very big thank you to the seminar group. It's been an absolute um, pleasure and privilege to be able to think about some of these ideas in this kind of setting and the kinds of debates that we've been having weekly. So I want to thank very much everybody here at CPCP and while also absolving them of any responsibility for um, what comes next. <laughs> um, what I will do in this presentation is, is essentially three things. I'm going to start in... Um, sort of very empirical fashion, talking about the, the extension of subprime debt into uh, the domain of auto lending in the United States. And I'm going to do that then by way of really starting to think about, or part of my uh, interest in cars suddenly is actually I'm using it as a device to talk about the financialization of households and the, the extension of debt relations into ever more spheres of um, everyday life. And thinking about that thirdly, to talk about this very contested and contradictory and shifting line between where credit is deemed to be a good thing that is, provides capacity and opportunity versus when it straddles to become uh, debt or a negative thing that can be associated with um, exploitation, uh, etc. So um, with no further ado, let me talk about um, subprime auto lending and why it's of interest. If we think back to sort of post-2008, the phrase subprime became something of a sort of toxic subject or dirty word when we thought about it in the, in the context of mortgage debt. Um, what has happened since then is that if we look at subprime borrowers who, depending on whose credit scoring you listen to, whether it's Experian or uh, Fair Isaac, we're talking about individuals of less than 600 or 620 credit score, while uh, the mortgage debt and credit card debt they've been holding has been stable or declining, auto debt has, has bucked the trend and has actually been rising. And various commentators have recently started noticing this and saying, you know, what's going on in this, uh, in, in this part of subprime markets? So last year, for example, uh, Standard & Poor estimated that a quarter of all new, sorry, all used car sales in the US were funded with subprime loans and uh, perhaps more remarkably, 13% of all new car purchases were made with subprime uh, loans. They also go on to talk about other signs of uh, growing distress in the market. They talk about lengthening loan terms, with more than 10% of those loans now edging into territory north of uh, six years, so we're going into sort of 73 to 75 months loans. Uh, the growing uh, loan-to-value ratios, those kinds of things. They are also very clear, though, that auto debt is not mortgage debt. The volumes of debt are much less, and this is not, they see it, they see it as a kind of market that is going to have the uh, calamitous impact on the US economy that mortgage debt did. So who's doing this auto lending? Well, we've been trying to find out more about a group of so-called buy-here, pay-here lenders, um, it's a, a growing segment of the industry, but having said that, the quality of the information on these, these dealerships is, is far from straightforward. They don't attract as much press or as much by way of official statistics and reporting as, say, franchised car dealers. What we do know about them, though, is that they perhaps have three essential characteristics. Firstly, they do a lot of their financing in-house. That is, they use instalment loan-type financing, and they're not selling that immediately on to other third-party financiers. Uh, and they're making those loans usually at very high rates of interest. Uh, secondly, from what is written about the industry in particular, uh, I use some work here by a guy called Ken Bensinger, who is a journalist, he was a journalist at the Los Angeles Times, 
uh, he's estimated that default and repossession is around the range of 30% in these kinds of lending markets. And uh, similar to payday lending, when you get a lot of churn and rollover of these kinds of loans, and that generates further opportunities for add-ons and penalties and fees. And when we say buy, thirdly, when we say buy here, pay here, it does mean if you buy your car from one of these people, then you return to the, the lot every week or every two weeks with your cheque or your cash to um, make your payment. So it's rather different then from uh, going with a franchised uh, dealer. And if this is just some data from Experian that shows you that these dealerships are very much specialising in you know, almost 80% of their business is in the prime and what's called the deep subprime uh, lending category. So they are real specialists at the very bottom end of credit markets for people who have uh, little or nothing by way of a credit history. And their marketing is, is absolutely designed with this clientele in mind. So uh, no credit check, no questions. Um, they're advertising in different languages. Since re uh, investigating these dealerships, I as a UK citizen with no credit history in this country, had been offered loans to go and buy myself a used car should I want to. Um, and this is an industry that um, has done very well post-2008. It's an industry that has thrived through austerity and recession, both in terms of the number of units that are being bought from these kinds of places and in terms of the total volume uh, of income that they're generating. So what we've been trying to do is um, pull together various disparate sources of data to try and get a better handle on what is going on in the industry, but also wider debates about how are different groups of households financing their auto purchases, um, how do we find out about that, what data sources can we use, and then how do we move from there to thinking about evidence of predatory lending or where lending moves from being subprime to being crafted to actually you know, result in substantial net losses for borrowers. Um, and in that kind of situation, what kinds of um, policy, policy initiatives are going on to think about these things, which I hope, again, we'll see some overlap with um, the other papers here tonight. So let me start then with just some broad aggregate um, statistics that we've taken from the um, something called the Consumer Expenditure Survey, which um, is, a, is a very useful source of expenditure data. What we have here is... Uh, we've just broken up uh, US households, and the black line at the bottom shows those in the bottom quintile for household income, that is the lowest 20% in those households. You see over 60-odd percent of them have more than one car. Um, if you look at specifically vehicle expenditures, though, the lowest 20%, uh, the red line, they are actually spending much less on their vehicles because they have lower incomes. That's the <coughs> result we would expect to see. And if you look at their overall spending on all kinds of transportation, and this includes things like buses and trains and whatever as well, then they're spending a much, the lowest income groups are not surprisingly spending a much higher proportion of their income on uh, their transportation needs. And again, that is uh, pretty much the, the cross the series there. What we've also done is um, looked in more detail at Los Angeles County as, a, as an example of an extremely car-centric regional economy. We've started looking at where these dealers are located, how many of them are, and what kinds of neighbourhoods they're locating in to see how they're targeting different groups of customers. So what we have here, if you can see the, um, the blue dots, are the new car dealers. The orange dots are the traditional used car dealers, and the buy here, pay here... Uh, we think we found 517 of them, but the boundary between when a used car dealer becomes a buy here, pay car, pay dealer is rather ragged and some uh, move in and out of these categories. But you can see um, the new car dealers are much more along the sort of Wilshire corridor and the, the used buy here, pay here are much more in parts of East LA, uh, South Central and so forth. And what we've just done here is overlay this with um, the demographic of the proportion of the white population. So you can see in uh, the darker shaded areas have the lowest white populations. And as you can see, as the map lightens up, you have uh, a higher proportion of uh, white uh, people there by census tract. So you get an idea there of the demographic or some demographics associated with the location of these dealerships. 
And another way of, of representing some of that information then we've just compared across the dealers, uh, their census tract of where they are looking at uh, by race and income. And there's no, again, no great surprises there. There'll be the biggest particular difference between the new dealers and um, both kinds of used car dealerships. And basically then, you know, if you're looking again by zip code, you're going to find most be uh, buy here, pay here dealers. They're going to be in East LA, uh, different parts of the city than you're going to find the new car dealers. Although I should, there's a health warning with this in that there's a whole other geography of uh, zoning and different cities competing to try to get auto malls to go to their city because they want the sales tax. There's a whole other set of uh, issues that overlay where dealerships go to, which perhaps complicate this picture. In terms of um, the concerns generated by these kinds of lenders, it sounds remarkably similar to what we experienced with uh, subprime mortgage lending. So lots of issues about uh, straightforward discrimination in lending, the quoting of different prices to different people, um, all sorts of issues of loan packing, add-ons, um, persuading consumers to sign away their rights so that you can't then go to court later. And these dealerships uh, will quite routinely fit their cars with uh, GPS trackers and with remote controlled ignition devices. So if you don't pitch up and make your regular payment, um, your car will cease to function and repossession um, is very straightforward. Now, so that's the sort of um, some empiric what we ha what we know a little bit about the industry. Um, why am I? Why are we doing this? Why are we interested in it? I think a lot of my previous work has been about looking at the sort of sociality of finance and understanding how it affects uh, different groups of people's everyday lives. And I think uh, looking at auto lending now is a is a way of getting into what one of Nancy Fra what Nancy Fraser would call one of capitalism's hidden abodes. It's about I think. Um, it's another, way, another arena from which we can look at how the very basics of everyday life are becoming wrapped up with taking on debt such that doing things like you know, getting to your job, sorting out childcare, etc., is now very much involved with um, having a car and how you finance it and um, normalising those kinds of debt relations. And the household, I think, is a key site from which we can explore these kinds of relations, not least because it's long been recognised, even by um, the IMF in the quote here, as being what they call this shock absorber of the last resort. It's a place where, you know, as welfare benefits are cut, um, and as, as de incomes decline, that the household operates as this sort of buffer zone that, where all kinds of other labours get performed to keep um, things running. So I think there's all sorts of interesting questions here about how we see patterns of um, debt being crafted anew in the household. I'm particularly interested in sort of gender relations, um, but there's also clearly issues about you know, generation and other things here going on. And people like Gustav Peebles have talked about, when we talk about credit and debt, we always have this, there's always this sort of slightly schizophrenic discussion about them, that we see credit as this good thing and the debt as a negative thing, and yet they are, of course different sides of the same coin. So when do we focus on um, the positive side of the expansion of credit and the opportunities that brings to buy your house or say, you know, get, have a car and get to work versus the obligation and the more negative and corrosive sides of debt. Something that Deborah James has been writing about very interestingly in her recent work about the uh, proliferation of subprime markets in um, South Africa. And thinking about this, you know, again, we're used to thinking about subprime mortgage debt, but at least with subprime mortgage debt, you could say, well, OK, you are buying into or trying to buy into an asset that we expect to appreciate in value. Um, so as, you know, your incomes may be stagnant, but you can maybe try and buy an asset that we expect to inflate, and that is your ticket to um, the American dream. I think with autos, uh, you know, we're looking at very different kinds of assets. We don't expect them to appreciate. They're involved in performing rather different tasks in household reproduction. So they're doing very basic things like connecting low-income families to their place of work, to um, their grocery store, to social services, um, to medical. And um, I'm no you know, huge advocate of cars here, and there may be people in the room whose jobs it is to persuade us that we should all be leaving our cars behind and using public transit, but 
uh, where we are at the moment um, for low-income households, having a car is, is a better predictor of whether or not you're going to have improved employment outcomes um, in public transit. And as lenders are aware, these are very, you know, buying an auto is often the second largest purchase you make uh, if you're not beyond your house. And this is a quote here in a piece in the New York Times from an investor at Santander Consumer, which says, well, you can sleep in your car, but you can't drive your house to work. Lenders are acutely aware that people will try very hard to keep repaying their auto loan, even if they're you know, strapped of cash for everything else. And um, this is just a graphic from a group in uh, Maryland called Vehicles for Change, who uh, take in donations of vehicles and repair them and then uh, give them to predominantly low-income women with children because here their graphic talks about the need uh, to have autos and what they've got. Um, they're working in the Washington, Baltimore area and how they improve um, their recipients' earnings, um, how they give them you know, greater access to employment and mean they can do things like take the kids to things after school. So fairly, fairly basic elements of everyday life being um, supported here by a group donating used cars. The second part of this then is also thinking about um, this line between um, you know, how these kinds of subprime lenders uh, exist and what it is that we think that they're doing. So we have... Um, you know, some of the debates about subprime mortgages said, well, you know, you've critiqued banks for redlining and being financially exclusive, and now uh, this is financial democracy. We're opening up credit markets to all sorts of people. Um, and uh, the other side of that would be um, some of David Harvey's arguments about this is a classic case of you know, accumulation by dispossession or what Gary Dibsky and his colleagues would call a surgical strike into the organised chaos of lower-income life. Um, the industry, again, would reflect both of these sides. They're very out there saying what we are doing is performing a public service. We are, you know, autos are crucial for these well-care outcomes. We're the good guys. You shouldn't be giving us a hard time. And yet you also get the literature is absolutely full of these quotes about um, the extraordinary rates of return you can generate in these kinds of markets, rates of return that are attracting in other used car dealers who are now moving down market to try and get a slice of the buy here, pay here pie, that um, low-income people needing autos are just gifts um, that keep giving. So um, about this, or what do we think about this? Um, I think a very interesting discussion this. Um, lots of debates about who, what, at what scales we try, and th try to think about this and regulate these things. Um, in California, they've decided they want to try and regulate um, the dealers, although they've signed into law um, two pieces of legislation that were also seen as being uh, extremely modest and basically as victories for the industry who managed to avoid things like an interest rate cap um, being implemented. Um, recently here in, uh, in New York, and again it was uh, some, one of the members of the group, thank you Pamela, who... Um, put me on to uh, Diane Savino, who's been now pursuing this in the, in the state Senate about regulating dealerships. And I see also that Elizabeth Warren is now taking up the issue of why is it that auto lenders were exempted from the provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act? Why are they not being overseen by um, the Consumer Financial Protection Board? And you can imagine the car industry's response um, to that when it was reported uh, last week. There's also debates about, well, why don't we regulate consumers? Why don't we teach consumers to better play the game of finance? And I, I have been told off on many occasions for being too sceptical about financial literacy. So I shall, be, um, I shall be a good citizen and stand here and say, I think at the very margin, in some instances, financial literacy is clearly important. But I think the stakes are so heavily stacked against, um, in different markets, consumers as... I think, um, I think educating about financial literacy is also in some places a device to stop us talking about regulating institutions or re-regulating uh, finances. And I think also the arguments about debt refusal have proved really difficult to gain much purchase because of the really individualised nature of debt relations and the whole politics of fear that go with um, you know, putting yourself and your debt 
on the line around this. And the also, I mean, all of these kinds of, you know, thinking about what we do about this, I, I find myself dwarfed by, and I'll put up this next graph by way of conclusion, which is um, the bigger picture of, in a context where this is mean income in the United States from 1984 to 2013, um, I find this quite shocking. But if this is the context of what is happening to household income, um, policy was relatively tame, and you can see the attraction of subprime uh, borrowing and lending, both for financiers um, and consumers, as more and more, arguably, the income distribution is in the range where uh, we look like those kinds of borrowers. I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. I think it's very interesting how in your graphs you make those lines look like barbed wire and <laughs> razor wire. <laughs> Something that you cut yourself on. Yes. Um, our next speaker is uh, Esther uh, Pieren. Uh, she is Associate Professor of Globalization and Media Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Been here long enough that you don't have the jet lag, right? No. Okay. <laughs> and Vice Director of the Amsterdam Center for Globalization Studies, ACGS. Uh, like Jane, she has a lot of uh, publications. I'll just mention uh, a couple of them. The Spectral uh, Metaphor, Living Ghosts and the Agency of Invisibility, that's uh, Polgrave and uh, Intersubjectivities and Popular Culture, Bakhtin and Beyond, and that's uh, uh, Stanford, uh, 2008. Without further ado, Esther. Okay, thank you for inviting me here, uh, Peter, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about higher education debt in the Netherlands. Um, higher education in the Netherlands has recently seen a wave of protests by students and staff, most prominently at the University of Amsterdam, where I work and where two university buildings um, were occupied for respectively 11 and 45 days. After the university board took court action um, to evict the pro protesters, both occupations were ended by the police, especially in the second eviction, of which these are images, uh, which was live streamed by a local television station. Unwarranted violence was used by uniformed and covert police officers. The second eviction, which the university board asked the police to undertake on a Saturday morning, even though the protesters had promised to leave the building after the weekend, and which ended up targeting not just the occupiers of the building, but staff and students attending an academic festival on the square before it, led to widespread condemnation. The Monday after the eviction, a thousand people marched to protest the action of the university board. And by the end of the week, under the influence of several petitions, both the Central Student Council and the Central Staff Council submitted a motion of no confidence in the university board. And in response, the president of the board, Louise Gunning, resigned. And she had made herself particularly unpopular by referring on the very first night of the occupation to the occupied administrative building as the property not of the university com community, but of the university board. While her resignation was widely considered a triumph for the protesters, I mean, for her it wasn't much of a tragedy because she already has a, had a job lined up at the national airport, which is going to give her far more money than she ever earned at the university. <laughs> but, um, so it was considered a triumph that she resigned, but it remains to be seen whether her resignation will lead to significant changes in the way the university and other universities in the Netherlands are run. At the moment, within the University of Amsterdam, committees are being set up focusing on the two main grievances of the protesters. The lack of the democratic decision making, particularly with regard to the budget cuts the university board argues are necessary because of the financial situation of the university, and the lack of insight into this financial situation, which some claim is the result not only of dwindling student numbers and less money per student being provided by the Ministry of Education, but also of real estate speculation. 
There are many things to say about the protests and the issues they have brought up, which also include adjunctification, with which you are all familiar here, I think, and rendementsdenken, a particularly nice Dutch term that refers to the as assessment of teaching and research output in purely quantitative terms. And there's also a lot to be said about the way the protests were dealt with, not just by the university board, but also in the Dutch media. What I want to focus on here, though, besides the argument that real estate speculation is what, what is putting the University of Amsterdam at particular risk, is the fact that despite the protests focus on higher education's financialization, there has barely been any mention of the impending switch on a national scale to a student loan system that will radically increase levels of student debt as well as lengthen their impact. While this impending policy change did generate protest by student and youth organizations, wider opposition was never mobilized, and it went through parliament with a comfortable majority, 97 against 55. I want to argue that this is due not only to how the new system has very effectively been framed and legitimated in terms of the production of moralized debtor subjects in line with the theories of Maurizio Lazzarato in the making of the indebted man and David Graeber in debt the first 5,000 years, but also to the way the system provides an out, or at least appears to do so, from the principles that debts have to be repaid are automatically instituted and are permanent. Okay, first some background. Until now, students in the Netherlands received a monthly stipend from the government, the height of which is dependent on whether the student lives independently or with his or her parents. And in addition to the basic stipend, there is a supplemental stipend for students with parents earning less than a certain amount or parents unwilling to support them. Both stipends constitute gifts. Because the basic stipend is not enough to cover university fees and living expenses, parents are expected to supplement to a level of subsistence, and students are also allowed to work part-time for extra income without losing their stipend. Taking out a student loan was also possible, but most students only do this when they exceed the amount of years the basic stipend is awarded for, which corresponds to the standard length of a BA or MA degree. And this is particular to the Dutch situation. Dutch students tend to take much longer to finish their degrees than the nominal length of these degrees. I mean, the, the expression eternal student in, in the Netherlands really means something. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite usual, it is quite usual for students to come out of university with some debt. Various government measures and increases in cost of living have also caused this debt to, to steadily rise. So in 2006, average student debt upon leaving university was 10,000 euro, and in 2014, it had risen to 15,000 euro. On the 1st of September 2015, this system will change. The basic stipend will be abolished, but for students with low-income parents, the supplemental stipend of up to 365 euro a month will remain a gift. For the student loans that are needed to replace the basic stipend and to supplement the supplemental stipend, the interest rate will be tied to the average yield of five-year national bonds and is thus considerably below general loan interest rates. Repayments will be a maximum of 4% of income above minimum wage, and if you earn under minimum wage, you don't, you don't repay at all. Your repayment doesn't start until two years after graduation, and they've come up with this idea where everyone is entitled to five joker years. This is, what, this is the actual expression that they use in the, in the government documents of not repaying, although in these years the, the interest will still accrue. The maximum repayment term is 35 years, and after that any remaining debt is forgiven. What is most interesting is the way the new system is rhetorically framed, beginning with its name. Most Dutch people, including me until I started researching this paper, think the new system is called the loan system, Leenstelsel, making explicit that what is at stake is a loan that needs to be repaid with interest. This is how it was long presented in the media and how the various political parties also presented it. But the government document that presented the new system to parliament in 2014 refers instead to the study advance, studievoorschot, 
and almost obsessively avoids the words debt and loan. An advance, of course, replies, implies a very different financial transaction than a debt. An advance is a partial payment of an amount due to the receiver in the future, usually a salary. The advance presents both parties in a positive light, avoiding the moral confusion Graeber associates with the history of debt, where both borrowing and lending carry a stigma. Someone offering an advance is being magnanimous, since the amount has strictly not yet been earned, while someone receiving an advance is seen to deserve it on the basis of what he will do to earn it. An advance implies trust rather than usury, as it is not, yes, it is not associated with profit through interest. In fact, the one providing an advance loses out on potential interest on money that could otherwise have been kept for longer. Thus, presenting the loan system as an advanced system gives it a very different, much more benevolent face. Significantly, in the government document, the words loan and debt only appear in a paragraph about the need to make students aware of their loan behavior and of the consequences of their choice to lend. So in presenting what is a virtually unavoidable injunction to take out debt as a behavior that might also be otherwise, and by associating the consequences with this individual behavior rather than with the state's systematization of student debt, the student debtor is moralized along the lines laid out by Lazzarato. To help students take responsibility for what is now framed as their behavior, the document reveals the government will develop a tool that will make the consequences of increasing or decreasing the level of borrowing or the level of repayment transparent in terms of what these behaviors will do to the total debt. This is the only point in the document in which the word debt, schuld, is used. And here it is relevant that Dutch is one of those languages in which the words for debt and guilt are identical. <laughs> so this makes the relation that both Lazzarato and Graeber uh, discern between borrowing and morality very explicit. What this paragraph in the government document also does is to tie awareness of and responsibility for loan behavior to awareness of and responsibility for study choices. <laughs> this implies that decisions about which subject to study or whether or not to pursue an MA after a BA can and should be taken on the same ground as decisions about debt, which, as Graeber points out, is one of precise quantification. In addition, it implies that such decisions mutually influence each other, in the sense that a particular study choice may lead to a higher debt or a lessened ability to pay off the debt, as certain degrees may be calculated to lead to more lucrative careers. An earlier paragraph departs from the notion that going to university pays. As someone with a university education in the Netherlands, earns on average twice as much as someone with vocational training. It is added that Dutch society also benefits from having people with university educations, and that therefore it makes sense that both society and students themselves contribute to make this possible. The paragraph then points out that until now, society has borne the brunt of this burden, with students only contributing a little. The implication is that this division will become more balanced and thus fairer under the new system, with the student contributing more by taking out and ideally repaying higher loans. Finally, it is acknowledged that not all students will become high earners, and it's noted that to ensure some students will dare to choose degrees not expected to lead to lucrative careers, only those earning above minimum wage will have to repay the loans. Again, the phrasing is is significant as daring to choose can be read neg negatively as risky or even foolish. This chimes with Lazzarato's argument that cognitive and cultural capitalism does not endow subjectivity with knowledge but with stupidity, even when qualified or overqualified. Reframing higher education as a social subsidy or loan turns students into society's debtors owing society not just financially, but morally. This moral accountability is further concretized by first specifying society into the taxpayers, 
and then individualizing these into specific people to whom a debt then appears to be owed. Thus, at the beginning of the document, one of the motivations given for switching to the study advance is a so-called fairness principle, according to which, and I quote the document, it is unfair that the baker has to pay for the stipend of the lawyer, unquote. The problems with this reasoning are obvious, yet it proved a powerful and successful argument in the public discussion about the loan system, as it seems to champion the less well-off. In fact, the whole document is designed to make it appear that the study advance will benefit rather than hinder students from low-income backgrounds and, later on, those in low-paying jobs. This is where the repayment term comes in. Presented in positive terms as much longer than before, it was 15 years, now it's 35 years, and thus offering a greater opportunity to do the morally right thing by paying back. This longer term is, of course, not a magnanimous gesture, but designed to maximize the repayment rate. Although a similar student loan system in the UK has already seen write-off costs as a result of non-payment reaching 45%, revealing considerable risk on the part of the state. The 35-year term also maximizes the time people are kept indebted, which, as Lazzarato notes, has the effect of depriving them of the future, that is, of time, time as decision-making choice and possibility. Because student loans will be taken into account in mortgage applications, albeit to a lesser degree than other loans, certain futures may indeed become less likely for those carrying high amounts of student debt. This puts an entire generation at a distinct disadvantage with regard to the dominant notion of the good life, which includes house ownership. Student loans also provide a powerful surveillance mechanism, as those carrying them will have to report to the Dutch state even if they move to another country, for example. Where those with lower incomes lose out then is not so much financially as in terms of the freedom to secure certain futures and to make certain choices. In Lazzarato's terms, you are free insofar as you assume the way of life, consumption, work, public spending, taxes, etc., compatible with, re with reimbursement. Under the proposed system, it is those who fully repay and do so quickly who secure the greatest degree of freedom, after the ones who never need to take out student loans to begin with. This, however, is obfuscated by the way the scheme is presented. The fact that the repayment terms seem far from onerous, especially for low, in low earners, and that the debt is specifically presented as not permanent and not repayable for those unable to, is one of the reasons that the loan system did not generate more widespread protests. Moreover, because debt is always deferred onto the future, and therefore can be disguised as an advance in this case, it may be particularly hard to mobilize young people against it, as they are most likely to consider their future infinite, and thus to remain blind to the way debt, in Lazzarato's terms, neutralizes and preempts this future. Whereas the debt incurred under the new student loan system remain for now abstract because the system has not yet come into force, the debts the University of Amsterdam has built up as a result of its real estate management are coming due and are having tangible effects, which is how they became central to the protests. The initially occupied building, which you see here, the Bunga House, which houses part of the Faculty of Humanities, including its board, was recently sold to a real estate investment company, which has announced that it will become a Soho House, which is a members club for people in the creative industry that also has outposts in London, here in New York, and in Istanbul. The Amsterdam Soho House will contain a club lounge, a restaurant, hotel rooms, a spa, a screening room, and this is specifically for the Dutch context, inside bicycle parking. <laughs> <laughs> no details have been released by the university board about the sales price. Although the occupation of this building was related more to announced budget cuts at the Faculty of Humanities than to its sale, the sale was invoked by the occupiers as symbolic of higher education's financialization. It also tied into wider discussions about the gentrification of central Amsterdam, 
The city council has been actively trying to clean up the area by restricting the sex industry, ending long-standing squatting arrangements, and promoting renovation for high-end housing and hotels. As the protests continued, and after the first eviction, a second building, the seat of the, um, of the university administration and board, which had also been occupied in the student protests of the 1960s, and so it was, had even more symbolic value. The real estate policies of the university as a whole came under more and more scrutiny. Not only were these policies, which, which aimed to centralize university locations in four campuses, requiring extensive renovations and new builds, as well as the selling off of all peripheral buildings, seen as imposed without adequate consultation, the details of their financing, which had not been widely known, were seen to expose the university as a whole, including its teaching and research programs, to great risk. The most vocal critic of the university's financialization through real estate speculation has been Ewald Engelen, a financial geographer and one of the most prominent spokesmen of the wider university reform movement that was triggered by the occupations. In a 2014 article, he and two co-authors already laid out a cautionary tale on the financialization of a Dutch university arguing that the 1995 transfer of real estate ownership from the state to the universities has, has, and I quote, served as a Trojan horse for financialization, triggering changes in organizational culture and a power shift from teaching and research professionals to accountants, real estate developers, financiers, and their ilk, unquote. Being granted ownership of the real estate in question, rather than making universities rich, in fact caused debt and investment to soar and solvency rates to decline. This is due to the fact that ownership comes with responsibility for maintenance. And especially at the University of Amsterdam, which comprises several monumental protected buildings, this is very costly. The proposed centralization of the university into four campuses was in part designed to cut these maintenance costs and to reduce total floor space. But it also required massive investment, estimated at 455 million euro. In budgeting for the new campuses, it was wrongly assumed that the framework of university financing and student numbers would remain the same and that the work of peripheral buildings to be sold would continue to rise. And then 2008 happened. And of course, this turned out to be very wrong. Financial and real estate experts with experience in the private sector were hired to, to engage in tax planning and financial engineering in order to keep the solvency ratio and the debt service coverage ratio within acceptable range for a positive credit rating. Although the university board has argued that there is a Chinese wall between the real estate budget and the budget for education and research, this wall would in fact crumble if these ratios would move outside this range. In 2008, Engelen shows, the University of Amsterdam, for the first time in its history, became a net debtor. In 2018, its debt is projected to reach 400 million euro. To ameliorate risk, the university took out derivatives and interest rate swaps. Although these swaps are not naked, meaning no collateral has to be put up for negative market values, and the losses suffered so far can be kept off the balance sheets, if accounting rules were to change, the solvency ratio would be badly affected. Thus, the real estate transfer to universities is exemplary of what Lazzarato calls, ne calls neoliberalism's injunction to become one's own boss in the sense of taking upon oneself the costs and risks that business and the state externalize onto society, and of its progressive transformation of social rights into social debt. It is then not just individuals that fall victim to this, but also institutions that were formerly considered part of the social good, but are now being asked to legitimate their value, again predominantly to individualized taxpayers positioned as creditors and therefore entitled to moralize and call to account anyone and anything they are, told, they are thought to finance, even though, of course, taxpayers themselves are almost always also debtors and users of at least some of the social services 
funded by tax revenues. Much more could be said about the way debt is putting Dutch universities and students at risk. And I look forward to the discussion, which might also bring forward some differences between the Dutch and the U US context. My aim here has been to highlight how, if we're ever going to leave behind debt morality and the discourse in which it holds us hostage, general accounts such as Lazzarato's and Graeber's, however insightful, need to be supplemented by detailed analyses of the functioning, framing, and challenging of debt in specific contexts, as it is at this level that both the problems with the debt economy and the difficulty of challenging it are most tangible. It is also at this level that it is clearest that even if, as Graeber argues, everyone is a debtor, not all of us are, individually or collectively, made to feel accountable to and guilty before capital to the same degree. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. I was just doing some calculations in my head um, with the, the 35 years to pay plus your joker years, right? <laughs> plus the, uh, the length of time it takes you to get the degree, they're going to be in their 70s before they finish paying the, uh, the debt. Um, but that's probably part of the idea, too. Um, I mean, in, in other words, the percentage doesn't have to be high if you extend the percentage over a longer period, right? Because it's the gift that keeps on giving, or rather the debt that keeps on taking. OK, um, our, our final speaker is uh, uh, Sophia McLennan, who is a professor of international affairs and comparative literature at uh, 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 Penn State University, where she also directs the Center uh, for Global Studies. Um, if she seemed a bit, a, a bit jet lagged, uh, she recently returned from Kazakhstan. Um, maybe you can make that part of the debt uh, critique. Um, her, She's published a whole bunch of books. Uh, the most recent is, Is Satire Saving Our Nation? Uh, which was co-written with Penn State undergraduate Remy Maisel um, uh, for Polgrave. So there's an example to us all. Um, and her forthcoming book is an edited collection uh, called The Routledge Companion to Human Rights and Literature, edited with Alexandra uh, Schultes Moore. Um, Lots of, uh, lots of other publications too, which would uh, probably take, take me into next week, I think. But um, I, I know Sophia from her work through, uh, with the uh, ACLA uh, uh, principally. And so I'm very interested to hear what she has to say about the subject of debt. Sophia. Thank you to everyone for uh, lengthening your day by listening to us. It's always an honor to figure that you managed to find a way to get somebody to come and listen to you when we all have so much to do, so many debts to pay. <laughs> uh, also, thank you to Peter and Mary and Lucy and everyone who's organized this. Uh, OK. Um, I will say that I actually started working on this in relation to the Society for Critical Exchanges um, session on debt this year. And um, right after saying I would do it, I was immediately miserable because I realized how much I had to learn that I didn't really know. I was like, this seemed like a great idea until I realized how much work I had to do to do it with any kind of like legitimacy. And um, I'm now sort of really a little excited about what I think might be possible here. So I'm hoping that I'll get some feedback from everybody. This paper begins by exploring the historical synchronicity between the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, the GATT Agreement on Trade Regulations, the establishment of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund all around the same period. After this initial synchronicity, the connection between rights and debt goes through a series of transformations that reveal shifts in the ways that these concepts intersect over time and in relation to changes in the global economy. The 1970s, with Robert McNamara in charge of the World Bank, 
the dropping of the gold standard, the oil crisis, the major wave of development loans, the increase in dictatorships in post-colonial nations, and the rise of non-Western neoliberal economics, specifically in Pinochet's Chile. My next phase, I'm going to give you this again, so this is just your first shot at seeing this picture. My next phase starts loosely in the 80s and captures the Reagan presidency, neoliberalism in the developed world, Mexico's moratorium on debt payments in 1982, the Washington Consensus in 89, and the establishment of NAFTA and the WTO in 94. And the fourth phase, uh, which kind of could be two, but I've made it one, starts with the attacks of 9-11, the human rights abuses of the US after the attacks, the subprime mortgage crisis and the consumer debt meltdown, the global food crisis, the establishment of the BRICS in 2010, and the BRICS plans to open a new development bank uh, later this year. Besides hoping to offer a periodization of a changing set of connections between rights and debt over four time periods, I'm doing this very fast, the major intervention of this paper is to suggest that much of the theory on debt approaches the issue from a first world perspective. At a basic level, the consumer debt crisis, student loans, and bankruptcy are very much first world problems. I argue that debt has always operated with two classes of what Maurizio Lazzarato calls homo debitor. In fact, at a certain level, we have an entire population of citizens that have never had access to an individual entrepreneurial credit-driven identity because they have been collectively supporting an indebted state. In order for this idea to make sense, though, we have to think about the nature of the state itself and the world system. In other work, I developed a theory of what I called riffing off of Giorgio Gombin's notion of bare life, the bare state. The bare state is the state that's included in the world system by virtue of its exclusion from sovereignty. It's the state that can be sacrificed with impunity. There are obvious ways that this affects the lives of those that occupy such a state, making Agamben's notion of homo soccer seem relatively provincial in the sense that for those living in a bare state, bare life might well look like a privileged subject position. What sort of debt do the citizens in a bare state have, and how does that tie into Lazzarato's notion of indebted man? Lazzarato identifies a new version of man, homo debitor to counter or complicate Foucault's homo economicus. Well, what if Lazzarato's trajectory is off? What if the story is not the trajectory of capital within a nation, but rather across <coughs> nations? What if the story of indebted man is unintelligible without that of indebted states? States that are only included in the world finance system by virtue of their exclusion from playing the role of creditor. The market difference lies in an economy where citizens have consumer debt and one where citizens bear the brunt of austerity measures so that the state can pay its debts. <coughs> What I'm arguing is that there's a parallel story about the making of the indebted state, a state so deeply in debt that the state can only bear state debts and not private ones. I'm sorry, the citizen can only bear state debts and not private ones. But the key, and it's essential, is that the indebted state is made up of human beings that do not even have the rights of indebted man. In other words, the very structure of exchange, reciprocity, credit, and redemption are wholly distinct because at no time is it understood that the indebted state will be otherwise. This leads me to another point I want to highlight before going into my phases. Debt and rights are interconnected concepts. We've sort of talked about this a little. But they may not be so in exactly the ways that Nietzsche and Lazzarato contend. This is so because as Graeber points out, the framework within which Nietzsche and Lazzarato work is entirely bourgeois, lacking not just a view to class struggle, but also a deeper sense of geopolitics. Both, I think, are right to note that debt changes our ideas of rights, and that debt offers an ethical framework to economics that's inseparable from our sense of individual rights. But as Matthew Charbonneau and Magnus Paulson Hansen point out, the making of indebted man suggests that the credit creditor-debtor creditor relationship gains its structuring power with the birth of neoliberalism in the 1970s. 
Following Nietzsche, Lazzarato tells us that neoliberalism inscribes guilt in the mind and body, fear and bad conscience in the individual economic subject. In order for the power of debt over subjectivity to have its effects, the, lo the, the logic of individual and collective rights must be replaced by a logic of credit. Individuals become capital. But such a notion of debt is too Western, too coded in Western ideas of exchange and the logic of individual responsibility. The ideas of the debt of civil society are radically altered if we take a post-colonial view. The assumptions of equality and reciprocity that underpin the debt creditor relationship are wholly broken down in a system where nation states are not able to exercise the sovereignty required to be a creditor and where, rather than be paid reparations for the violence the colonial system wreaked on their nation, they are rewarded with the honor of owing their former colonizers' debt. This is the core conflict that haunts the relationship between the world market system and the finances of de developing, I feel like this is NSA listening. <laughs> This is the core conflict that haunts the relationship between the world market system and the finances of developing nations, just as it haunts notions of rights. The indebted state and its subjects are only seen as reciprocating equals at the moment of payment, but not at the moment of inception of debt. In fact, the debt, just as rights, are often offered as a gift, which transforms over time into guilt and obligation. Lazzarato relies on Nietzsche's concept of debt as a, I cannot say this word, mnemotechnics of cruelty and pain, which serves to breed a human who can keep a promise. What happens, though, in the case of the subject that was never seen as worthy of bearing a promise? What history has developed instead is a system that constructs a human being who suffers cruelty and pain for someone else's promise. In the developing world, state debt is a gift only until it transforms into punishment. All right, so I'm going to give you my first phase here. Uh, the, um, this phase begins during the Second World War with the story of the Bretton Woods Conference when 44 nations met, led by the USA and the UK at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, in July 1944 to discuss economic plans for post-war peace. The core concept was that peace depended on economic cooperation. The idea was to create a truly global market where capital and goods could move freely and where they would be regulated by global institutions committed to greater stability and predictability. Bretton Woods led to three regulatory institutions, the International Monetary Fund, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which later became the World Bank, and an international trade organization, which came into being as GATT and then later became the WTO. Richard Peet and Unholy Trinity, the IMF, World Bank, and WTO, points out that the classical notion that trade prevents war and brings about peace was present in the Bretton Woods project. Thus, from the outset, there was a commitment to the notion that economic stability and capitalist development are good for human rights. In the Bretton Woods discourse, the world was publicly described in terms of the free market, with sovereign autonomous states enjoying equal opportunity in an open international system, except that in 1944, many states did not enjoy anything close to sovereignty since many were still colonies or were not recognized by the world system, a fact that reveals that the discourse on sovereignty, economic progress, and rights was an exclusionary system. It was also always an expansionary system. For Pete, Bretton Woods also represents the aggressive desire of the capitalist market to expand globally beyond the boundaries of the developed industrial world. Like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the world trade system was framed by the rhetoric of reciprocity, the practice of hegemony, and the development of interconnections that cultivated bare states which lacked both sovereignty and credit. The difference, though, was that the UDHR did indeed offer a way to envision a level playing field for rights, even if such a vision was not only unattainable but also aggressively thwarted. While the banking system was always a game of using a notion of universality to deepen dependency, the universal system of rights actually works somewhat in the reverse. 
While it's common to hear critics deplore the universal in rights as nothing more than a cover for empire, the truth was that at the signing of the UDHR, it was the non-West that welcomed the chance to debate what universal rights would mean in a world system. In the year, early years after the UDHR, it would be the non-West that often advocated for a universal language of human rights because such a stance ratified their claims to self-determination, sovereignty, and free expression. As Akira uh, Ri and Petra Gouda point out, during this early phase of the human rights era, it was the Western colonial powers rather than the third world representatives who made a case for cultural relativism. People forget the story. Since from their view, giving colonial subjects equal rights would endanger the public order. The key terms and the ones that show up throughout the distinct eras of the development of the world economic uh, and rights system are order and stability. The issue then is less about a tension between universality and relativism, but rather how order and stability were defined and to what ends. All right, here's my second phase. Michael Goodman, Goldman points out that the World Bank's first 25 years were marked by a cautious approach to investment. Most bank loans went into areas of infrastructure deemed necessary to stimulate economic growth and not to actually grow the bank, which would have been frowned on by the US Treasury and Wall Street. In fact, in the 1961-62 World Bank Annual Report, the greatest problem cited for the bank in its early years was lack of demand. This would all change when Robert McNamara transitioned from escalating the Vietnam War as Secretary of Defense to escalating debt as President of the World Bank in 1968. To give you a sense of the economy of scale we're talking about, in 1961, the World Bank committed just under 900 million in new loans for 29 projects in 19 countries. 20 years later, it offered 8.8 .8 billion in support of 140 pro projects in 50 countries. Thus, this phase sees the entrance of the IMF and World Bank into the calculus of the Cold War and a concerted effort to use capital as a defense against socialism and debt as a tool to lock states into a dependent role on the capitalist market. The order and stability that had been connected to peaceful human life in the early phase moves more directly into a connection with capital as a synonym for peace and freedom. Human rights are defined as the right to participate in economic development. Those that are not on the road to development are described as deprived of the most essential rights. It's worth remembering that when McNamara first took control of the bank, he openly pushed to change the course of the bank's mission. He began to use the language and political strategy of development rather than investment banking, which had been the phrases used at the time. The window opened for him to execute his new plan when the 1973 oil crisis hit and ushered in the wave of petrodollar loans, which would not only strengthen the role of the World Bank in the global economy, but would also open the way for private bank lending. All these loans from private banks made up the private part of the developing country's external debts. While it was close to zero in the early 1960s, this private part of the debt reached $36 billion in 1970 and $380 billion in 1980. The new world bank, this new world bank identity also signals the violent use of the language of rights and the economic strategy to limit, if not outright abuse them. Only six years after Nixon decided to abandon the gold standard so that he could retain the influence of the US over the global market, the language of human rights emerged in force on the world scene. I think this synergy is really interesting. The part of the story that we missed back in the 70s was that it was not just the torture of bodies that would haunt these nations as they tried to heal. It would also be the debt. From 1976 to 1980, debt grew at an average annual rate of 20%. This is the era when loans both private and public to dictatorships across the global south were justified in a Cold War logic that had the global finance system buying off despotic puppets in the name of securing the stability and order of the free world. But the key was that not only was much of the debt loaned to despots who embezzled it and did not use it to support their populations, but that it was also loaned with the full knowledge that the loans were not making developed nations. They were making indebted states. All right, here's my third phase. The debt party would first start to get ugly when Mexico defaulted on its debt in 1982. 
That default sets an immediate, pu immediately punitive system into motion. Mexico was the first nation to suffer the IMF structural adjustment program, which demanded a reduction in public sector spending, reduced government subsidies on basic consumer goods, and imposed privatization. 1999 brought what has been called the Washington Consensus, which builds off of the 1985 Baker Plan and refers to the set of policy reforms imposed when debtor countries in Latin America were called on to set their houses in order and submit to strong conditionality. What's noteworthy for my purposes is that the citizens of the indebted state are now to be punished as full stakeholders in a system that had excluded them as bare life from the outset. So it's interesting, when are you visible, right? When, are, when do you have responsibility and when do you not have any, you know, uh, any subjectivity that's worth defending, right? Um, they're now not the poor, uh, they are now not the poor who need the aid of development, but rather fully formed homo debitor that must make do on the state's promises. The other key feature of this era was the way that privatization was defined in exclusionary terms. The emergency loans of this era were always about protecting private creditors and punishing citizens who had limited power in the private sphere. Because the IMF vowed to protect creditors first over citizens in indebted states, creditors could take on more risk since it was a false risk they would never need to truly assume. Meanwhile, the citizen had the private responsibility to serve the public good in terms, of, in terms of owning up to the debt system, but did not have the public protections of the state in any meaningful way. The effects of these policies on human rights are well known. I won't go into all of it. Rise in poverty, decline in public health, increase in radicalization, etc. don't need reiterating. The key takeaway is that this is the era when debt openly and explicitly has more rights than citizens do, and when the social impact is so extreme that it leads to a number of intense transformations and world protests. All right, here's my last phase. As we think of, through the history of the capitalist economy, we can now start to see the early part of the 21st century as the era when we witnessed not just capital accumulation, but debt accumulation. The exact same practices that it caused indebted states to borrow in order to pay interest seeped into the developed world and caused a major debt crisis. That's what most people are really talking about this last phase, right? We can't, however, look at the subprime mortgage crisis outside of the global food crisis, events which happened literally in tandem right, from around 2007 to 08. The practice of variable interest rates that decimated the middle classes of a range of nations was already a well-worn habit that had been used on indebted states. So too the bank bailouts that protected creditors from risk and punished debtors to reciprocate on their loans despite the fact that they had never held equal status in the system to begin with. And then came austerity and what some termed the third worldization of the West. Meanwhile, it's worth noting that just as developed economies faltered under the weight of unsustainable private debt, developing economies saw their citizens accumulating more personal and consumer debt. This is a very weird thing that I found. Uh, so they had more credit card debt and other forms of individual debt than ever before. Um, and those moved more increasingly into the global south. These developments solidify the reality that in today's market, debt can't fail. But besides the explosion of private debt in both the developed and developing worlds, the bigger part of the story is the way that this new phase has created a new geopolitics of debt. If we were overly invested in the West versus the rest paradigm, we might celebrate the rise of the BRICS economies. The BRICS announcement that they will fund a new development bank and stories like that of Venezuela bailing out Argentina as the end of the Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods era. But I don't agree with that. I follow uh, William Robinson on this trend and caution that the story is less about the decline of the West and more about the rise of capital. For Robinson, the sector of society to watch is no longer tied to specific nations, but rather to a transnational capitalist elite that often operates from within nations that were previously considered to be peripheral economies. These are the very same elites that benefited from the IMF, the World Bank, and the private loans to begin with. As we mull over the impacts of these shifts, I suggest that we return once more to Lazzarato to offer one further correction to his theory. 
The tra trajectory of outline teaches us not only about the making of the indebted state, it also teaches us the story of the rights of debt. Rather than focus on the biopolitical morality of indebted man, it might be more interesting to consider how debt itself has acquired its own biopolitical claim to rights. If corporations are people, maybe debt is its ethical code. While the concept of human rights is a powerful mobilizing force and one which, will, which still holds, holds hope for resistance, we can now see rather clearly that the world system has always favored the rights of debt over the rights of individuals. Human rights have not just been violated in order to protect debt, they have often been established solely to govern the human capital responsible for paying back debt. Well, um, you know that whenever you discuss debt, um, it's going to be very uplifting. Right? You're, going to, you're going to leave the room with a big smile on your face. Um, I'm a little worried that my car's not going to start now when I... Uh, it's totally not going to start. <laughs> and, and that wasn't the NSA, that's actually radioactivity in the basement of the building. You know, picking up on it. So, we have time. We have... We've had three great papers and we have time for uh, questions. Um, you can address them to individuals on the panel or, or to the panel as, as a whole. I think we have three uh, pretty different uh, perspectives on different um, aspects of, uh, of debt to uh, discuss. Um, try to minimize your um, uh, Quotations from Lazzarato, but, <laughs> but it is, I mean, it should be said, though, that everybody had a, a critique of, uh, of Lazzarato at one point or, or another, so that, but I don't want to t uh, turn him into a piñata either, but, uh, but, so, questions from the floor? Ruthie. Oh, I wasn't willing to be first. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll go first. Um, fantastic. This is a great panel. Thank you all for your thoughtfulness and provocations. So I have, um, I think there are questions, one to each presenter, but maybe there's just one question for all three of you to, to mull over. And I was, I was really interested, Jane, in, um, in how you describe uh, dealers now moving down market in order to take advantage of the gift that keeps on giving. And, um, and uh, as I listened to the two papers after yours, I was thinking about the movement, the, the sort of self-conscious and deliberate movement in the world of capitalism toward that particular corner of capitalism, where money just makes money and everything else is an excuse to get there. So I'd be, I'd be interested to know how and to what extent uh, Dealers make that move. You know, do they do they make formal moves? It's just advertising differently, and so on and so forth. How do they do that? And related to that, Esther, I was thinking about your um, your argument about real estate speculation, which is fantastic. And I started to wonder whether even in that, whether money making money as against the real estate being purposefully what the universities are after uh, might have. Um, might help us keep thinking of this horrible churn of debt. And then um, finally, Sophia, uh, fantastic paper. Um, I wonder whether um, you've encountered the work of Robin S. Brown, who wrote a lot about, about part of the period you're talking about. And I was also curious whether you kind of moved your, took your phases and then looked back uh, 40 or 50 years in the 20th century, whether thinking about debt and those relationships without the Universal Declaration of Human Rights might or might not produce similar insights. I mean, the US became a creditor nation during the Second World War. Versailles certainly laid out mm -hmm. a system of, of, um, of relative sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Germany became an indebted, blah, 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 all of those things. Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm curious to know what you think about this. And then all, going all the way back to the 19th century, certainly Haiti is 
has been made not sovereign and perhaps, yeah. as yeah. you say, bare state yeah. for a long time. So, thank you. Would you like to answer in, in the order in which the question is? <laughs> 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 okay. Thanks for the um, what the dealerships do is they relax their lending criteria. So they, mm -hmm. if they traditionally lend or have certain thresholds of um, credit score mm -hmm. in used dealerships, then they um, stop using those. Or some dealerships now have stopped using, who would previously use a credit score to stop using them completely. Mm -hmm. So um, they widen their advertising. They advertise through all sorts of. Uh, you know, different targeted TV campaigns, or word of mouth, that they, um, through Facebook, all kinds of avenues, mm -hmm. they are basically trying to pick up more uh, low income uh, purchasers. So, some dealerships now are these, are these sort of mixed dealerships where they have, you know, parts of their business they still retain use of credit scoring for some lending, but in other parts they're basically doing things. Um, off book and are doing sort of instalment loan type mm -hmm. rather than um, different kinds of loans. Mm -hmm. But also, with all of these, I mean, one of the part of the joy of these kinds of loans is that you can bundle them up and through securitization uh, sell them on to somebody else. And there's a lot of inv bigger investment groups um, like GM and Santander of private equity who are in part driving the, the, what they want these asset backed securities and they're driving car dealerships to generate more of these kinds of um, bonds because they're very lucrative. So um, the used car dealers have basically just dropped their uh, use of credit scores. Is that, I'm just curious, does that change what they actually have in the, in the law? The short answer to that is I don't know yet. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think you'll get, yeah, you'll get a different selection of cars, mm -hmm. I think. But I don't know. I don't have enough information to properly answer that yet. That's um, one of the things we're going to be doing. Is a series of interviews. I hope with um, the dealerships, and also I'm going to be in a convention of these guys, and I hope they are mainly guys as well in Las Vegas next week. So things like that, and that how easy it is to move between these types of dealing, and what actually that means. More, I'll have a better handle on at the end of next week. Excellent, I'll check in with you. <laughs> or you could just take us to Las Vegas. <laughs> Esther. I think what's interesting about the real estate situation in universities was this transfer that was made, right? So this was a huge thing in 1995. The state had always been the owner of the university buildings, and the university just used the buildings and had nothing to do with the maintenance or any other, any other financial um, interest in that. And then when the transfer was made, I think at first the universities felt that this would, this would somehow make them money <coughs> because they hadn't foreseen that this would, this would turn into this, this thing that would just bring in debt. And this fits into a wider strategy, I think, on the part of the Dutch governments, consecutive governments, to, make, you know, to try to privatize universities to a certain degree without actual privatization. Because actual privatization in the Dutch context is not is not politically sellable yet, so the moves are made to pri to privatize uh, certain aspects of the universities by giving them responsibility for for aspects of university that they previously no responsibility for, and then what the universities do is they they transfer this to the faculty level. So what you see happening is this individual individualization where every little unit of the university becomes fully responsible for its own functioning. And that then creates a system of debt to the, to the larger units. So first, what we always had was a system where um, there was a lot of redistribution going on from one faculty to another, from one department to another. And now that has, that has all been kind of at least rhetorically financialized into a system where if, some, if one department gives another department something, that's a debt. And that, that has to be repaid in some other way. So in that sense, it's, it's kind of this weird privatization without real privatization. And that's, that's what's happening also with the, with, the, with the real estate. And it's just showing up more clearly in the real estate arena because I think of the financial crisis and what happens to real estate prices then, because that sort of screwed up the whole uh, planning that had been made 
Um, and I think if the financial crisis hadn't happened, this would still be invisible. I mean, we just won't know about it. We wouldn't be aware of it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, this 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 idea of keep putting things, putting more responsibility in smaller units, and not giving people the um, any kind of redistribution then becomes reformulated as as a debt credit situation. And especially in the humanities, this is at the moment, of course, really problematic because you have the, the other faculties like economics, medicine, etc., saying, well, we are supporting the humanities. What are the humanities doing for us? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Where have I heard that before? <laughs> and this is, again, also with what I was talking about with the rhetoric of the taxpayer, right? And you, I, I'm sure you have the same thing here. But this idea that the taxpayer is now an actual person with a name who can, who is individually kind of um, has the has the right to ask where his individual money is going, and then to hold different entities responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And somehow, one single taxpayer can hold everything that is paid with taxes responsible, and not the other way around. It's, but I think it's very similar to what is happening here. Although in the Netherlands, we tend to be always a little bit kind of behind, and it tends to be a little bit more, it tends to be a little bit more opaque, because because certain things that you can quite openly, um, that are politically sellable in the US are not politically um, sellable in the, in the Netherlands yet, although that will change probably soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just take the sort of question about the deeper <clears throat> history, because it's a, it's a really good point. And the piece that I did on the Bear State um, it was just an essay, and I, I'm now realizing that it might be kind of neat to make a short book that just does the bear state and the state. And the, the, the bear state um, theory is a longer theory about sovereignty and questions about that. And the case I really looked at was Afghanistan, but there would be plenty of other states that work exactly that way, right? Where any effort to actually exercise sovereignty is always punished. Like, so it's a false sovereignty, but it's an inclusion of sovereignty because the world system needs it. Right? It, needs, it needs a certain amount so that we can impose these sorts of relationships on you. Um, and so I don't know enough about sort of what happens in that post-Westphalian period and how the, I, I just hadn't thought a lot about the debt side of it, but I think it will match what I've been mostly saying, which is that um, it was never ever imagined that these states would play the game on equal terms. So. Um, I do think it changes uh, from all of the ideas that we have about loans, uh, or personal loans, like because the, the originally, you know, we've seen them fall apart now, but they originally were con the economy. You had to have, you had to have collateral, you had to have this, you had to have that, and these were loans that were that were just designed to more than anything to stick you into the system. It was clear that that was really the game, so I, I just need to research that more. Um, but I. Uh, I think it's a very different way to talk about problems of sovereignty. And so I really want to keep working on it a little bit. So I'm having fun. I'm having fun. <laughs> In the ways that I have fun. <laughs> You're among friends. <laughs> this is how I get my kids. <laughs> Just briefly, the, I, having done a little bit of work on the, on the piece of uh, Westphalia, the, the this question about sovereignty is, is actually ambivalent within the document enough to um, suggest that, uh, like France and Sweden, for instance, they wanted the, the, the right of invasion uh, with the Holy Roman Empire, um, and they got that. So that's the, the, the right of occupation and invasion in imperialism is already in the document. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a funny kind of um, uh, defense of, uh, of sovereignty. You know, it actually in includes its own states of exception. Yeah. Um, uh, and then the only reason I've been reading it again is, is around the effulgence of the failed state. Um, um, right. Immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's sort of a verdict on post-colonialism. Other questions from the... Yes, go on. Um, yeah, this is a question for, sure. I guess, Jane and Sophia or whoever wants to comment. Um, in line with trying to connect with what's happening with financialization in the West and financialization in the world, or sort of debt in the world more broadly and a longer history of that. Um, so first of all, in Jaina, in your, one of your first graphs shows your credit card debt versus uh, subprime credit card debt versus subprime auto loans versus subprime 
uh, mortgages, I guess, and uh, it looked like the credit card debt was actually, had started off significantly high and was falling since the financial crisis, as I understood your draft, right? But it was actually still higher than other ones. But anyway, since the financial crisis was my understanding that it, uh, credit card debt was declining while auto, uh, auto loan debt was rising since then. Um, I'm curious if you or anyone else in the panel has any uh, explanations for why credit card debt has been falling since then, or if it's only, and also if it's only subprime credit card debt or credit card debt more broadly, is this a direct result of the Dodd-Frank Act and the new regulations, or are there other <coughs> explanations? And then to connect it, you uh, mentioned this sort of toward the end of your talk that uh, right at the same moment we see credit card debt exploding in the BRICS country at least, and I'm not sure if it's in the Global South more broadly or just in the BRICS. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's a direct connection between that decline in the U.S. and rise elsewhere. Is it the same credit card companies who are uh, sort of looking for a new avenue as these avenues get closed off in the West, or um, is there some other explanation? Great question. Uh, great question. Um, the short answer is I don't know, but um, I think <laughs> I'm happy to speculate anyway, as ever. Um, I think so. Part of it is that so that was a the graph was about the proportion of subprime uh, borrowers holding that kind of debt. So part of the argument is that people have either defaulted on those debts or they've been paying them down, um, or you know cutting up the credit card. Um, the relax, the rela or yes, I think. Um, I don't know enough about the regulation of credit card debt in the U.S. to see whether you know Dodd Frank has got something to do with that. But I think the question about um, its relationship or its its you know leveling out and decline here and the growth elsewhere is a fascinating one. I would encourage you to um, explore. But yeah, I don't know enough about uh, the regulation of credit card debt here. So my discovery about the rise in consumer debt. Um, in certain places, especially the places that I was seeing it popping up was like in Argentina, Chile, places like that, um, was one of those last things that came on my radar as I was trying to put the paper together. And I thought, wow, this is sort of really unexpected. And I got data that was like, you know, average Chileans are like having, say, $6,000 in credit card debt. That's crazy. So one of the things that I found um, fascinating about it uh, if you want, I can try to send you the links to the data on the rise of it, um, is uh, there seems to be two kind of competing things happening. In, and I don't have an answer on the banks, but that would be a really good thing to figure out. Uh, one is that um, debt's just looking for new places, right? So that's not that surprising. But the other side that's kind of creepy is that it also suggests that there's the concept that, that the Chilean consumer is a good, is, is worthy of bearing the debt. So this is, if you bring back to what I was saying, like it's a strange, it's a strange thing. Uh, Nestor Garcia Conclini has a book called like Consumers and Citizens, and he talks about how, you know, in a place like Mexico, citizenship is, is so deeply tied into whether one can play at the game of capitalism, not just be punished by it. So it, it seems to be a double-edged sword, almost like, yay, I can get this kind of debt. Um, or, oh, that's horrible though, right? You know, you know this is going badly for you. So I, I think people uh, generally read it as a very negative thing because the debt is unsustainable, as you well know. Um, they've always had, I mean, all of these countries have always operated exactly like, you know, cars are buying a lot, of, you know, what they call quotas, right? You're, you're doing payments. That's not new per se, but the degree to which one could overextend, especially in credit cards, is new. And so that is fascinating to me. Um, and I think the big question is, is it Citibank? Is it uh, it's Spanish banks? Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I mean, not surprised. And I would also maybe have a look at Deborah James's book, because she's written about the, you know, the, the black middle classes in South Africa and the explosion of all sorts of forms of debt. And um, she's talking about the argument there that people haven't gone through that in order to emerge at the other end and not have access to the fruits of consumption. It's again, it's this curious, double-sided, and you think, okay, you know. So but she's, she's got lots of ethnographic material from South Africa and about the, uh, the, the mentality and morality of this explosion of debt uh, in New South Africa, which I think would be interesting. I mean, the one other thing to add to that is that when you talk about things like regulations, and that is one of the things that when you're a consumer in countries like this, you're really screwed. I mean, I, I, when I lived in Lima, I, we talked to people who were from 
you know, lower income situations and they would say, um, I bought a car on, you know, 25 payments and when I get to the 23rd payment, they will tell me that I was two days late and they take the car. And like they're two months away from owning the car. Like so, and just constantly uh, taking advantage with the system that really wasn't designed to really look out for uh, the buyer. Should tell them to exercise the Joker year. <laughs> the Joker. Yeah, there's no Joker year. No, no. Yes. Uh, yes. This question is for Esther. Uh, in the pictures of the occupation at the University of Amsterdam, I couldn't help but notice the use of the red square, which was first used in Quebec in 2005 and popularized in 2012. I'm curious uh, if these students were drawing on Quebec experience yes. and uh, what the extent to uh, the solidarities were that formed between those. Yeah, so it was inspired by that, and so they had the red square and everyone wore the red square. And also, we were at, there was a lot of communication with other student protests that were coming up at the same time. So there was an occupation at LSE um, in London, and there were there was a lot of contact. I mean, these uh, the students who were organizing the occupation were in contact with a lot of uh, student movements in other countries and trying to get tips about how to prolong the the movement, how to communicate, um, exchanging um, ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there was, it was really seen as part of a more part of a larger international uh, movement, even though the issues are very are partly quite specific to the Dutch context, of course, and also to Amsterdam. I mean, the the, the greatest pity I think was that 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 there were a lot of international contacts, but actually what was quite limited was the effect it had on other universities in the Netherlands. Because universities in the Netherlands have have come to see themselves as competitors, and this is this is been very damaging, especially in the humanities, because for about 10, 15 years now, humanities faculties have been struggling at every Dutch university, and instead of sort of banding together and trying to trying to come up with a plan that would have all the universities working together, the attitude has been well, if it's not my university that's being hit, then actually departments disappearing at other universities in the Netherlands may be beneficial for my department. So departments and also student organizations have not been very efficient in mobilizing on a national level. Uh, so sometimes international mobilization is also is also easier than national mobilization. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way national mobilization might have been more effective in the long run than, than kind of putting it in this international frame. Although that was also quite useful. Other questions or answers? <laughs> yes. I had a quick question, um, Jane, about the about the, the autumn loans. You know, during the the, the subprime uh, mortgage loan period, right? We had the the infamous ninja, right? Mm -hmm. The ninja loan: uh, no income, no job, no assets, right? So. I actually talked to a, a guy who bundled uh, financial products and, and I asked him how they could make money out of that. Um, I mean, how many payments would the person have to make in order to make money off that, um, off that loan? And he said, well, ideally one payment, but often <laughs> uh, no payments. What? Because of the bundling, because it's tranched, they can make the money further up Further up the, the uh, further up the loan, if they need to, if the if the poor person does try to come up with the money, then that is just icing on the cake. It's kind of the reverse of the icing on the cake. But the, he he didn't expect always to have any payments made back in order to make money on the loan. But also at the bottom of that chain is bricks and mortar, which. Again, when all this started, was the idea was again the classic idea is if you default on your mortgage, in a sense it's okay because the bank recovers bricks and mortar, which oh, yeah. will be appreciated in value. Won't they? <laughs> no, yeah. So we, we, that's one of the things we learned in the crisis mm. that the asset that is supposed to unpin it and the, the implacability of house rise, uh, house price rises has yeah. has, um, has gone the way. But with securitization, um, there is, I mean, people are saying now this market is in part being pulled from the top end by mm. investors mm -hmm. with this demand for bonds because the mortgage bonds have dried up and the credit card bonds are slowing down and they want 
they want subprime bonds, they're great money earners. So mm. they, the argument is that a lot of this is being driven by investors' demands for bonds, uh, encouraging these kinds of loans to be made. Yeah, because there's a, a... And again, you sell them on for a fee, and you, um, again, I think you can probably, just in the act of selling them on, and persuading somebody to buy those tranches, mm -hmm. which will be, you know, that was triple A rated. Right. You can oh, take, a little, <laughs> <laughs> you take a little piece. Always triple A for some, uh, for some because reason. Because they've been analysed, Peter. <laughs> 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 but as we know from the subprime crisis, all the credit ratings are just opinions, mm -hmm. so therefore no liability there. Mm. With Dodd Frank too, uh, I mean I'll shut up. But uh, Dodd, Dodd Frank, um, we, there are the loopholes are buried, you know, hundreds of pages into the into the bill, right? And so um, you know, the, none of the people who passed it actually read it, of course. But I describe it as the Emmental of legislation. You know, it's got so many holes, in it. but like it. but they haven't, you know, they haven't reached all the holes yet. Um, and, and so, and I think one of the holes is, is clearly being exploited with uh, with subprime auto uh, auto loans, right? And and as they close these off, they, they move to a different part of the bill where where there's still a hole to be found, a gap to be uh, uh, exploited. And then once you've done that, then you offshore, you go to your subsidiaries, um, and maybe that also helps to explain why the credit card. Uh, Yes. That's picking up uh, elsewhere. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, this question is for Sophia. Uh, from what Esther said, given the shared experience of debt and how that can unify students across geographic boundaries, uh, taking into consideration the financialization of capital and debt relations around the world, can this be taken further and can the resistance to debt be used as a unifying bond that can bring together people? across social and geographic boundaries in terms of a type of universalism from below that can be? Um, well, I mean, I think there's examples of some of that. You might remember like when, uh, who was it? Some, uh, I want to say YouTube, but I'm not sure that's right. But there, there, there's been a number of moments when there's been sort of debt forgiveness. And, you know, uh, I didn't, this, as you can imagine, I had to run through a lot of stuff. but. It, I could give you data which would show that um, some of these states are serving interest on their loans that far exceeds any spending on any sort of infrastructure or you know, education. I mean, so the, the concept here that's very straightforward is that the debt has been structured in such a way that the state has two choices. It either functions as a sovereign state that takes care of its citizens or crumbles apart while it serves its debt. I mean, if you look at some of the things that are happening in Africa today, you could argue easily, easily that there was a two-step phase. One was constructing states where there hadn't been states, and the other was giving them debt. <laughs> oh. And then if you look at those two things, you can see, predict the kind of breaks downs that you have now. Um, I would say, based on my own experiences being in places like that, that um, People are extremely savvy. They know full on what's going on, but they're 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 mad. You know, the problem is that um, when you're angry at the World Bank, it's not easy to figure out how you, where you're mobilized, what are you going to do, where are you going to protest? And so often it seems that they're protesting against the state, which will repress you miserably. So um, uh, again, in Latin America, you can't imagine how excited right Argentina is uh, to have Venezuela bail them out. I was there when Chavez died. Everyone was crying. I was like, wow, I did not expect this. So like the sense that they could get under out from under the yoke of the West is very exciting, but they're forgetting that they're still not out on, uh, out from debt. Um, uh, the sort of contemporary economic theory that operates in Argentina today is a, a phrase called Neo de Sarroismo, you know, Spanish, that sounds very weird. It sounds like a new version of, of, of development economics, but what it really is, is it's a, it's a marriage between neoliberalism and development economics, and it's completely as schizophrenic as it sounds, right? So it's sort of a populist thing here, and a complete, you know, let's have Monsanto buy all state lands at the same time. And so, uh, 
I think that if you were to really want to mobilize the conversation, it just has to be about capital and, 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 and all of that. I mean, it, the, the debt piece of it is, of course, really important, but it, in the more current and urgent crisis for people like that is to try to recover things like their land, um, which is being leased and sold and uh, you know, the Argentine pampas that were the primary source of their economy have been sold to Monsanto, which is growing soy and ruining it, like, ruining it. Like, it will, it, they're just leaving, you know, literally tumbleweeds. Because they don't have any reason to take care of them. Yeah. So that, that, that's a more, that seems to be a place um, where I think that, that crisis is, um, you know, to, to use nine to five, like capitalism is stupid, and, and reminding people, like that's a really easy way for people to, to protest. I think that might be the more effective way. And, um, sadly, I think the debt thing has to be done in ways like this. I think we need to educate people about the complexity of it, and I think that we need to make that vocabulary available, because I don't think it is. Um, and everybody's talking about debt, but they're not seeing the larger, bigger pieces as any I just say something really depressing as well. <laughs> you, I mean, your, your question else, again. something else really. <laughs> Sorry, um, it's just our English person. I know. Well, we've just had a general election as well, so I'm, I'm still. Oh no, no, no! That's why but I'm wearing black. You talk about you know, the possibility of debt. You know, unifying groups of yes. students. I mean, I would say yes, but the flip side of that as well is that um, debt is turning our students into customers rather than students and with all the individualizing elements of that and competitiveness and wanting value for money and um, feeling aggrieved if we have students coming to seminars who haven't done the reading why should they discuss their notes in front of them because then they're getting a value without contributing I mean it's in all sorts of ways and then um, and again their fear about their individual debt burdens and needing to finish and get a job etc so Yes, they have a common experience in many ways of debt, but also I think an increasingly sort of fragmenting and individualising sense of I need to get on and that person hasn't done as much as me and, and whatever and um, more competition between them and uh, wanting to say, well, you know, that department gives me that, why, don't, why doesn't this department? Yeah. And it's, you know, playing off uh, or expecting, you know, value for money. And, evaluating education in those terms as well. So it's, I would say, a double-edged sword. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, if you're on the other side now, as students are, you know, we're making offers for our graduate program, these kids are like, give me more money or I'm not going, I need this, I need this. So the whole process has become completely financialized. I mean, it's important to not to forget why student debt became what it was. It was because the state was tough. Yes. Now, like if you're not careful, you fight the university, you fight the fad, what you get is like, okay, all right, and the gyms, they're, they're, they're expensive. But still, like there's lots of things going on, but I worry sometimes that we're, we're actually doing what they want, we're all fighting inside, and um, the next thing you know, we will have return to a very classed system of education, and um, yeah, I think we should be fighting for more, you know, Commitments like what you you know where the where the where states or the federal government promise certain amounts of uh, financial support gifts to students of different sorts that's got to be the fight. If you fight your own university, you're kind of fighting into their the big meal of the plan. Yeah, I mean this was very interesting at, at the protests in Amsterdam, right? Was that the ministry of the minister of education in the Netherlands was very supportive of the protests because they were aimed at the University of Amsterdam. And it made it very easy for her to sort of say, well, there, there's a problem at the University of Amsterdam. And of course, what it was really about was about the Ministry of Education. Right. And it was about her policies. But by pushing it back on the University of Amsterdam, that, that made it actually easy for her to avoid that discussion. Because what, it, what it's really about is the fact that the ministry is giving universities less money per student yet expecting universities to have more students and to deliver them and get them diplomas. And 
research money has also already been taken away from the universities in the Netherlands and placed with a funding body that now runs research competitions that are so inefficient in terms of the overhead that it costs to run these research competitions that it makes absolutely no sense. It was much more efficient when research money was with the universities. It could be divided relatively easily. But then, of course, that's not playing into the discourse of excellence and whatever whatever else comes with that. So it's the ministry is cl very cleverly um, trying to make these things seem like local problems. And with with student with the, the student loan system, it's quite complicated in the Netherlands because there was also a there was also a demand for more more of a student loan system. Because one of the problems in the Netherlands has been that there didn't used to be a possibility to lend money to do university education. And particularly, there was no, and there is, still is no possibility to lend money to do a PhD. So there has also been a demand to make this possible. And this, I think, is with debt always. There's, it has two sides, right? People want to be able to have the right to go into debt over certain things if they think what they're getting back for it is, is of enough value for them to go into debt. And education is just an, is quite an easy sell for, for debt. But there was also a demand for this um, because the old system also had its, had its problems because it very much relied on, um, on parental support, which was not always easy. Um, either because some parents just did not give it. And then you were in a very difficult position of not being able to finish your university education. It's really interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated by the story you tell because in, in the United States there may be similarities. Um, the Middle Income Student Assistance Act in the United States that created the um, expansive student debt programs that burden people today um, was passed uh, right at the end of a long four-year economic downturn in the mid-70s in the States. It was signed into law by Jimmy Carter. And many people who are in the business of uh, giving out, not business, they had the work, the administrative work of giving out student financial aid said this is going to be the worst thing that will have ever happened. Not because we are against students having access to post-secondary education. It's what we do. What I did was my day job. But rather, it's going to change everything, and it did. For the first time in more than 10 years, the cost of tuition in public or private um, independent colleges went up because it could, because suddenly the loans were available to, to cover the full cost of tuition. For the first time, enormously, there was um, debt money available for people to go to private for-profit trade technical schools, which had not existed before. There were, there were very modest kinds of aid for students to go to those kinds of schools that attended to be gift or work. It wasn't debt. Right? So this changed everything. Everything. And it was right then. And so the demands that people were actually making in that period from you know, 73 to 77, which is we need something, was translated into and reflected back to them as you've been asking for debt and here it is. Yeah. How about it? You know, people weren't saying we want to borrow money. They said we need some money. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, two quick things. First, again, a reminder that we're going to have a reception up on the sixth floor in the sociology lounge right now. And uh, second, thank you all panelists for such wonderful papers.
He used the two-way switcher, yeah. The Y splitter. It's not even a... Oh, he got it screwed on here real tight. Man, the Bible is up on here. They must have been hearing them stuff. 